Thanks to Ken for putting this together, for inviting me. Thanks to the Barons for funding uh, the, the visitors program and for being a big part of that, this whole idea of bringing the humanities and uh, the sciences together around these things. Um, I guess I just want to start by saying it's really tough to be in between the musical theater and the musical act. That's, I've never ever been in that position before and it's, it's worse than being after lunch. So I've got all these things against me. Um, <laughs> And it's an academic talk, so oh my god. Um, so this, um, what I'm doing here is, um, it, it's a paper that just came out in the journal Environmental Politics. I teach environmental politics, uh, I'm trained in political theory, and I really sort of uh, am at this intersection of the social sciences uh, and the humanities. And what, what this is about is, uh, it's a broad overview of the discourse of environmental justice. So what has environmental justice meant? What has environmental justice changed? Uh, what has the language of environmental justice been and what has been its meaning? And for me, importantly, where is it going? So not just what has changed uh, uh, in the past, but where this language uh, is going. And th the basic argument, I mean, it's more of a, of a descriptive talk than an analytical one, but there is a, 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 there is a point uh, to be made. Um, and the, the basic argument is that the discourse of environmental justice has really been broadening uh, and, and expanding in scope far beyond uh, what I think anybody sort of uh, initially uh, imagined. So from thinking just about inequity in the distribution of environmental risks, uh, which was one of the uh, original ideas, environmental justice discourse has challenged the, the basic definitions of things like environment and justice. That's no small feat that the very meanings of these terms in the public discourse uh, have changed. Um, <clears throat> so, but I think the, the major point that comes out of all this is that there's been a shift in the relationship between those two terms, between environment and justice. So getting, getting to really the conclusion, but getting to the, the major thesis, at the very start of the movement, Environment was something that was just another symptom. It was another problem, another indication of social injustice, broadly stated. And over the last 20 to 30 years, the relationship between environment and justice has shifted so that now a lot of discussion about justice is about the environment that supports any conception of social justice. That environment is not a symptom now but it's the basic necessity for any distribution of justice, any conception of justice. And I think that's really a major conceptual shift, and I'll, I'll come back to that uh, again and again. I promise you'll get tired of that. So, a few things that I want to do. First, I want to talk about how the early conceptions of environmental justice really did push a couple of basic boundaries uh, on environment uh, and on justice. And not just on justice, the, the, the key thing is that environmental justice uh, was about injustice and the construction of injustice and how injustice uh, was constructed. Um, environmental justice, and this is one of the reasons why I enjoy it and why I think it's important within this context, it's always been a disruptive discourse. It's always been a challenging uh, discourse and I'll explain a little bit about that. Um, the second point that I want to make is that, and this is a point that geographers make, uh, Julie Z, uh, uh, Gordon Walker, that environmental justice has really expanded uh, in a number of different directions, ex expanded horizontally to a number of different, uh, very, very different uh, problems and ideas, ex expanded horizontally to be a sort of analytical framework for a number of global issues, including climate change. And then for me, the important thing is that it's expanded conceptually uh, as well. Uh, it's pushed, for me, liberal political thought uh, in, you know, beyond individuals into communities and beyond the human uh, into the non-human. So I'll talk a bit about that. Um, and then I want to discuss some of the recent extensions of environmental justice discourse, just where this is going. I'll talk a little bit about climate justice, uh, a bit about that relationship between human beings and the non-human realm and ecosystems, and then on to some of the, the contemporary movements uh, where Kim actually started with and, 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 and brought us to yesterday around food, for example, uh, around energy generation, um, and um, maybe I'll even talk a little bit about crafting uh, and moving. But the, what's being called just transition 
or sustainable materialism for the academics, what I'm starting to call the environmentalism of everyday life. Uh, and that's kind of my next uh, big project. So start from the beginning. Beginning of environmental justice, it was all about inequity. The, the focus was on the inequitable distribution of environmental bads and risks. It was poor, uh, poor white communities, uh, uh, communities without power, poor black communities. Uh, and it was really about this um, uh, fact that some communities were receiving more environmental risks than others. Some were getting a lot more environmental bads. And the flip side of that, of course, was that they weren't getting environmental protection either. So environmental goods weren't flowing to those communities. But it was all about linking exposure to risks and bads to class and race. And it was about inequity. And it's still about inequity. It's still the sort of crucial center of environmental justice discourse is that some people get screwed more than others. And there are good reasons for that. Um, my own argument um, on this is that inequity, though, and I, I wrote a whole book on this, inequity has never been the sole focus of environmental justice. And this isn't one of those things that sort of evolved over time. Inequity has never been the sole focus, because from the very beginning, um, it wasn't just about maldistribution. It was also um, about challenging the very conception uh, of how we thought about environment, and how we think about uh, the idea of justice. So as for the first, the idea of environment and the environmental justice movement, and I, I have a really hard time um, getting this across to students now. I'm old enough to remember when I first started teaching environmental politics, how all the students understood environment. When you said the term and you did environmental politics, it was about the outside. It was about the wilderness. It was the yet heavy stuff, uh, the big outside and all of that. It was nature. Right. And environmental justice just challenged that. Environmental justice insisted that the conception of environment had to be where we live, work, and play. The very famous line, environment is where we live, work, and play. Environment is everyday life. Environment is the quality of the air. It's what's coming down into neighborhoods. It's what people are breathing. It's what they're eating. It's what they're drinking. It's what flows uh, through the body. And I'll actually come back um, to that idea. But it's, it, it is not just something that is a way. Uh, and now when I teach this, when I teach environmental politics, that's just assumed, right? That's not a big deal. Now, right? Students get that. Well, of course, environment, environmental politics, that's about, it's about the everyday environment. But that's great. That shows that environmental justice as a discourse has had a huge impact because there really has been this shift uh, in the public discourse. And I see that embodied in students who don't think this is a big deal anymore. Whereas 20, 25 years ago when I was first teaching that, that was sort of a shock. Maybe that's because I was in Oregon with a bunch of hippies, but um, it was still um, a shock back then. Now, I don't want to say, and I'm not trying to say that that broadening of the concept of environment meant that environmental justice ignored uh, nature or ignored um, the non-human world or ignored things like endangered species and landscapes. From the start, environmental justice uh, was about expanding the conception of environment, not replacing it. Uh, and some of the most interesting exchanges for me uh, are in early environmental justice meetings where African American leaders are meeting Native American activists for the first time. And you go and just read the first principles of environmental justice, which were developed at the first National People Environmental Leadership Summit in 1991, the very first principle of environmental justice affirms the sacredness of Mother Earth, ecological unity, and the interdependence of all species. Okay? That did not come from you know, Bob Bullard and the sort of classic uh, urban African American activists. That came from a recognition of the validity of that perspective uh, of nature. And then, of course, Kim's work's demonstrating right, that this idea of environment uh, as nature, as, uh, as a relationship with soil, as, as outside, that has a long history uh, in African American thought as well as in Native American thought. And so um, it wasn't just this replacement. And I think there was, in the environmental movement, in the mainstream environmental movement, a sense of a threat. Right, that environment was going to mean this new thing and not this old thing, and it was going to take resources and focus and, uh, and the public way, and that was never um, supposed to be the case. Now, another major focus of environmental justice scholarship uh, and the movement itself 
has been around the concept uh, of justice. So, again, the idea of environmental justice was from the start not just a statement that we're dumped on more, right? That there is this inequity. There was always an attempt to try and understand, to try and argue, to try and point out, to try and illustrate where injustice came from, what the reasons for injustice uh, were. And this is why environmental racism was such a salient idea early on uh, in the movement. It's why when the US EPA established an office of environmental inequity, the movement said, no, it's not just about inequity, it's about justice. Right? We want an agency that is looking at environmental justice, and the, agency, the, the, the office in the EPA was renamed. So, um, so while there was this sort of focus on, uh, on equity, uh, there's a lot more done about where this comes from. So folks like David Pello have written for a long time on, um, on industry seeking the path of least resistance. So where can pollution go where there's the least uh, resistance to it, where there's the least power, uh, where it's easiest to externalize uh, industrial waste or social costs or environmental costs. Um, and there was, and Pello's very good at pointing this out as well, uh, an association, a recognized association. Communities of color um, were polluted, and so they were associated. They were dirty communities, and so to externalize the waste uh, was just a natural uh, outcropping of that. And so there's a critique of that kind of racism that saw communities uh, as less valuable uh, in that way. Now, the, some of the work that I've done sort of picks up on that and looks uh, more particularly at a concept of recognition. And this comes out of some justice theory that it's not just about inequity, it's about why. Uh, and it's not just about race, but it's about a broader understanding that uh, communities aren't recognized, they're not valued, uh, they're, um, uh, they are made invisible in some way. This is certainly uh, in the Native American community. There's just an invisibility, right? It's just not, they're not there, they're not considered. Their culture, their religion is just not considered. And so that lack of recognition is what leads to the despoilation uh, of sacred sites, uh, for example. And beyond that, and again, I think this is crucial, Environmental justice, the, the idea of environmental justice has also focused on just the basic functioning of communities. Right? That it is the way that communities work. It's the interruption of the way that communities work. So it's the poisoning of a community, or um, it's about health, or economic development. Just the basic capabilities that are necessary um, for communities uh, to function. That's absolutely key. So that's the first area of um, uh, of what environmental justice discourse has offered in the past uh, couple of decades, just expanding and pluralizing the conceptions of environment and justice, bringing a whole range of new meanings uh, to both of those. So what's happened since then? And um, again, geographers have really focused uh, on, uh, on this idea that environmental justice, it's just been, again, this sort of salient discourse that's, that's picked up uh, and expanded. And if there's been a single major measurable development uh, in the framing of environmental justice in the past couple of decades, it's been this spatial expansion of the use of the term. Um, so while there's been a, a continued focus on this sort of core of environmental justice issues in the distribution of toxins, for example, or the distribution of environmental bads, environmental justice discourse has really sort of expanded in, in well, topical scope and geographical scope, um, scope as well. So even just in the US, and you can just look at Bob Buller, and Bob Buller, he, just, he has this great line where he says, I've written the same book over and over and over. I've written 10 books, but it's the same book. And it is. It's the exact same book, but it's on a bunch of different topics. So he's moved from toxins and dumps to analyses of transportation to land use and smart growth policy, water quality, energy development, and jobs. It's all the same sort of argument, just applied um, to a number uh, of different issues. <clears throat> and the expansion of this course hasn't just been to a number of issues, uh, but to location as well. And one of the things that really humbles me uh, is that my own theoretical framework for you know, what the justice of environmental justice means has been applied to a range of issues 
all across the globe. So there's just a short list of, of people citing my own work and using it as a framework. Um, Post-colonial environmental justice in India, waste management in the UK, agrarian change in Sumatra, nuclear waste in Taiwan, salmon farming in First Nations in Canada, gold mining in Ghana, oil politics in Ecuador, wind farm development in Wales, pesticide drift in California, indigenous water rights, and co-management of, uh, of land in Australia. Um, and that's just one framework of what environmental justice is being used across the globe on a range of issues. So the scope, uh, uh, the geographic scope uh, of the expansion of the discourse uh, has really been huge. And then, of course, you get not just this horizontal expansion, but you get a vertical one as well. David Pello, I think, is, is singularly responsible for this, to take environmental justice to start to analyze uh, global issues and use it as a framework for an analysis of something uh, like the distribution of global toxins. Um, I've looked at uh, indigenous rights movements as using this frame, food security movements are using the framework uh, of environmental justice, and then of course the big one uh, is the climate justice movement, uh, which I'll come back to. But again, picking up this framework, this discourse of environmental justice, applying it to uh, these global issues. So the movement use of environmental justice discourse and academic analysis of the issue has continued uh, to expand uh, in scope and scale. It's clearly, environmental justice is clearly this engaging discourse, this salient discourse uh, and analytical frame. Now, I think it's gone in a couple uh, of additional directions. Oops. Oh, one more. Okay. There are a couple of other than the spatial, the ones the geographers like, a couple of, to me, really crucial conceptual barriers that, um, that environmental justice has crossed. And the first is, and I mentioned this before, but I want to talk a little bit more about this, this link between the individual and the community. And again, the, the, the liberal conception of justice is very individualized, um, and environmental justice movements uh, can be seen to focus on just um, uh, the, the situation of individuals or the condition of individuals, but it's always um, been used at the community level uh, as well. Uh, the discourse of viral justice is used to reflect on impacts on communities, limitations to communities, and individuals simultaneously. And I think it's this, um, there was a, a mention um, yesterday by Mary Evelyn of this idea of the communitarian correction. And I think environmental justice has played uh, that part. So, as an example, Hurricane Katrina. So, the impacts of the disaster of Katrina were clearly um, disproportionately experienced by poor African Americans. And it's always, that's, that's an obvious focus. Many lost their homes, they lost their jobs, they lost their belongings. Many were pushed out into a new diaspora, and so they're separated from their community or they're left behind and made invisible. Um, by racism or pushed out of the, the plans uh, to rebuild. But the understanding of the impacts of Katrina as an event go far beyond the injustice to individuals. So um, Bullard and Beverly Wright have the seminal set of reflections on, uh, on, uh, on Katrina, on the environmental justice implications uh, of Katrina, and they address a range of basic needs and functions that were undermined by both the storm and then, of course, the response or the lack of response um, to the storm. Um, that would have to be re um, restored in some sort of notion of a just recovery. Right? Transportation, employment, health, housing, this diaspora, political and economic participation. And this isn't just about individuals. Right? This is about the damage done to the community as a whole, to New Orleans as an entity. Uh, and to the particular neighborhoods and communities and relationships uh, that are there. So it wasn't just about the functioning of individuals. Uh, any kind of environmental justice return to New Orleans had to address the very functioning of the community and all the basic needs uh, that make a community work. Now, the other major, so I think that is a, a major conceptual uh, uh, um, contribution that the environmental justice movement makes to environmental discourse, to justice discourse. The other one, and I'll come back to this, is the idea of the relationship between the human and the non-human, and Katrina is a turning point there as well, uh, but I'll come back to that. So, <clears throat> even with the recognition of this broadening scale of the concept and application of environmental justice, 
Um, there are a number of new challenges and developments that continue to push the conceptualization of environmental justice in engaging new directions. And this is where a lot of my work uh, is going now, and it's a lot uh, of what's happening in the movement. Uh, and again, I think this is where we're starting to see the shift. This is where the idea that environmental damage is simply a symptom, a symptom of inequity or injustice is shifting into a recognition of the need for uh, a stable environment or a working, functioning environment in, in order to have any kind of sense uh, of social justice in the end. So the first sort of major shift uh, that I want to talk about is uh, with climate justice and the expansion. The, the, the idea of climate justice has certainly been a key discourse surrounding climate change for the last couple of decades. It's one of the things that I was working on uh, as a Barron Scholar uh, a few years back. Early discussions of climate justice focused on the responsibility for creating, you know, who's historically responsible, uh, how do we use justice as a normative framework for mitigation efforts and policies, how do we allocate the costs of prevention uh, or technology transfer to the South. So climate justice theories originally, and before the movement really got involved, um, focused a lot on distributive equity. Uh, those approaches took existing conceptions of distributive and social justice and applied them uh, to the climate debate. And I, I, I don't want to criticize those theories, but I do want to contrast them with a very different environmental justice uh, set of concerns that developed um, into a, a very different notion of what climate justice is about. So a lot of climate justice groups didn't start thinking about climate justice from the sort of uh, you know, liberal theories of justice and equity and all of that, but they started with the principles of environmental justice. So the organizations that got together in Bali to come up with a list of the Bali principles of climate justice worked directly out of those original uh, uh, principles of environmental justice that were developed in 1991. There was a direct link uh, being made um, from battles for environmental justice in poor and minority communities in the, to the construction of climate change, to the experience of an equitable environmental devastation, and, from, uh, and to the exclusion from environmental decision making. So as with environmental justice, these notions of climate justice arose from the experience of communities, from the material conditions, and not just current material conditions, but the anticipated material conditions, understanding of what a future life might be, uh, uh, and these experiences of local communities. And climate change was still seen right, as, as another, if broader, environmental manifestation of social injustice. I think as we've shifted, and as environmental justice communities and climate justice communities have shifted to the reality of climate change, um, post-Copenhagen uh, post especially, um, the, the focus is turning more to adaptation and more to an understanding of or an attempt to understand the very specific types of vulnerabilities and the inequity in the distribution of those vulnerabilities. And, and the shift has been to thinking about ways of adapting to climate change and how climate justice can inform uh, a notion of adaptation policy if it didn't work uh, on, on prevention. So you get environmental and climate justice activists and movements regularly addressing the actual material experience of changing environmental conditions. Like what are the impacts going to be on everyday life? Um, the stories of potential health impacts of heat, um, of food insecurity due to droughts and floods, the instability of housing and infrastructure, the disappearance of tradition, uh, of culture, of place, these have all become the norm uh, in the climate justice discourse. And adaptation discourse has focused on vulnerability enhancing events, what is going to happen that's going to bring more vulnerability um, to these uh, sorts of practices in everyday life. And I think what's happened there is that that focus has been made, has helped to make the relationship between the way that natural systems and human communities um, function and interact much more clear. There's been much more recognition of the way that natural systems support the functioning of human community. So this is where Katrina comes in again. So before Katrina, 
Right? Environmental justice in Louisiana, environmental justice in New Orleans, environmental justice was all about Cancer Alley. It was about all the production, the oil refineries, the chemical refineries, the vinyl manufacturing going on between Baton Rouge uh, and New Orleans. And it was about what came out of the stacks and fell onto the communities, right? and how that affected the communities and the health of the communities. But it was all like that. It was all close. It was Katrina changed that. It was Katrina. Post-Katrina, there was a recognition that it wasn't just what came down onto the local community. There was a recognition that what these factories were doing, what the oil refineries were doing, were going a bit higher into the atmosphere. We're changing the climatic system, creating stronger storms that were then going to come in and devastate the community in an entirely new way. So it was a recognition of the change of the climate system due to the very things that they were already protesting. And then there started to, um, to be, and Lisa Jackson tells this great story about her mother's growing concern uh, with the Delta and the condition of the Delta and how dredging and, and everything that goes on has really just lowered the defenses, the natural defenses that would have protected the city. There's a real shift from this idea of just this inequitable distribution of environmental bads to we're screwing up a nature that supports a community. And Katrina is that kind of moment, uh, in a, this sort of paradigmatic shift uh, in the way that nature, the relationship between nature uh, and environment uh, is understood. And that's going on uh, in a number of different places. Julie Z is doing some work in California on the sort of natural cultural systems uh, in the Delta. Uh, and I've been making arguments about uh, the relationship between functioning ecosystems uh, and functioning human communities and applying a notion of climate justice um, to the natural world uh, as well as to human communities as well. So there's been this, sort of, this, this great experience, this sort of conceptual shift uh, to thinking more uh, about um, living systems, right? a concern with living systems and the interaction uh, of the human and non-human systems. Um, yeah, do I want to talk about that? So I think yeah, this gets, and I'll skip through this because I've talked a little about it. I think it, it really does get to um, a, a new way, and it's not just, I, I guess the only thing I'll add to this, it's not just that it's a new way uh, of thinking about this relationship. I think there is, and this is one of this has been one of my arguments. There's a conceptual bridge here between the potential conceptual bridge between environmental justice uh, and uh, more broadly conceived environmental concerns. I find it fascinating. We don't have time. I don't have time to talk about it in depth, but I find it fascinating um, that the language is starting to match up between environmental justice and environmental restoration. That restoration has lost its normative frame. The, the, the environmental restoration used to be about going back to a point in the past. Uh, to going, this was the normative frame. We need to go back to pre-settlement. Nature was this thing that we needed to restore to this point in the past. Well, that doesn't work anymore. With climate change, there's no going back. And restorationists have understood that as this. And restoration has now, um, I mean, in their definition of what ecological restoration is, are focusing on uh, the functioning of ecosystems restoring the functioning of ecosystems. And I think there's an incredible link to be made there um, and a few movements and books <laughs> to be written on the relationship between functioning communities, human communities, uh, and functioning ecosystems. Uh, again, it's interesting, the UNFCCC, the original idea, the injustice, the problem of climate change was the interruption of the functioning of the climate system. Uh, and now, of course, there's a whole movement around something called wild law. Uh, in Ecuador and Bolivia and New Zealand even, um, to give rights and justice claims to not just human beings but to the natural world. So I think there is, uh, in this conceptual expan expansion in, in environmental justice, I think there is the potential uh, of a discursive bridge with a number of other movements. And now, and last, um, where is environmental justice going now? Environmental justice is going to everyday life. Uh, and uh, reframing uh, ways of thinking uh, about the sustainability of everyday life. And I think, I mean, obviously, the most well-known environmental justice battles have been reactions to inequity or threats to health or the capabilities of communities or responses 
to misrecognition, exclusion from political um, decision making. But there's been a, a growth of groups using environmental justice and sustainability, just sustainability as Julian Ageman calls it, uh, to design and implement new practices of everyday life. Um, and I see this in, um, in food justice movements, in just energy development, um, and in actually in crafting and making movements, uh, and I'll hold off on those for today. But we can talk about that in questions. But these movements directly take on both unjust practices and institutions and unsustainable environmental processes. They're not satisfied with sort of the individualistic and consumerist, and, and I think this was mentioned yesterday, right? Um, sort of individual actions. What can I do uh, as a student? It's not just about you know going to Whole Foods or not Whole Foods, you know, and buying something different or putting uh, panels up on your own house. It's about the creation of institutions, right? Kim, it was actually the response that you had to my question yesterday. It's about creating new ec economic opportunities, new economic institutions, new community institutions for the very flow of something like food or the flow of something uh, like energy. It's a, I'm trying to find a name for it, it's a reconstructive environmental justice. Uh, I've called it sustainable materialism, and most people don't like that term. It's just, that's way too academic. So yeah, the environmentalism of everyday life, I think, um, is where I'm going to go with this. So the focus in a lot of communities is on resisting and rethinking and redesigning basic institutions that embody problematic uh, practices that are connected with our basic material needs. So the key response to food deserts in Detroit, for example, is growing and sharing food in community-supported agriculture, in collective gardening, in urban farms, and farmers' markets. Uh, it's this idea of food justice uh, as a community endeavor, as the building of new institutions. Um, but it is about replacing a food system that is unjust. So the food justice movement isn't just about equity or better distribution of good food, but it's about the transformation of our relationship uh, with food, with its production, with its transportation, with its consumption. It's not just about supplying a basic need, um, but it's about the awareness that such basic needs um, that supply the functioning of a community need to be sourced, need to be run without the creation uh, of injustices. And we see the same thing in terms of energy. So you get a lot of environmental justice communities, not just in the US, um, but around the globe, organizing around the development of community-wide uh, local generation and networking of solar. And with the idea of just energy transition, there's a lot of this going on in Navajo, where I used to live uh, in Arizona, getting away from coal and participating in everything destructive about the coal industry and exploitative about the coal industry um, and nuclear as well as an Navajo or victims of the nuclear cycle in a number of different ways. And moving to just energy that not only takes care of the community and provides energy in the community, but does it uh, in a way that is productive and restorative as opposed to destructive. Now, I talk about these movements in a number of different ways. I just want to mention two important ones here. I think it's crucial. Look, environmental justice is a movement of resistance. Uh, and it's been a movement of resistance from the beginning. And I, I use a Foucauldian frame to look at these new developments of institutions because what, what people are doing is physically removing their bodies from the flow of food or energy that they find problematic. Right? And if Foucault taught us anything, it's that we participate in the reproduction of power. And what these movements are doing is pulling themselves out of that. And not only that, but reconstructing new flows of materials. So new flows of food, new flows of energy. Again, creating these new institutions uh, that are just institutions. So it's not just about individuals, and it's not just uh, about getting out of something, but it's recreating and participating in and reproducing uh, new flows. And for environmental justice, this is crucial because you know, early on it was about the flow of materials through the body, but it was toxic materials, right? One of the first things of the environmental justice movement was environmental health in the Silicon Valley and, and women having miscarriages on the floor of, um, uh, of silicon chip manufacturing plants, right? It was about the flow through the body um, and resistance to that, and it continues to be that, but in a positive and more reconstructive uh, way. So that's one. Um, and the final thing 
don't know how late I'm going here. Um, <clears throat> for me, I think this really is um, this embodiment of a new form of materialism, a, a development of practices that reimagine and reconstruct not just institutions, um, but also our relationship with the natural world. So these food movements are being done not just to, to respond to food deserts, right, but to respond to industrialized agriculture and the damage that industrialized agriculture does. Right? Um, community energy movements, just transition, uh, energy descent movements are doing this, again, not just to provide energy, but to do something about the way that energy is now produced being destructive to natural processes. So there, that is an absolutely key component to the thinking about the reconstruction of new institutions, is this relationship between human systems and the natural systems on which they depend. And that is, it's a very conscious uh, idea, it's a very um, articulated uh, idea, um, and that's why, that's why I have a difficulty with the, the name of this thing, but it's this mix of material need and sustainability uh, and institution. So environmental justice in this way has really expanded beyond a reactive uh, position to environmental conditions. It now means a refusal to participate uh, in practices that create or circulate injustice, in practices that create and circulate damage um, to environment. And now it's all about this creation and participation in counter institutions, counter flows, counter practices um, that embrace a sustainable relationship uh, with the non-human environment. And I, this is one that there's hope. Right? We talked about hope and hope losing. And this is one of these things that actually does give me a, a, a bit of hope because I've seen what environmental justice has done in other areas of environmental discourse, right around both environment and justice. And if it does the same thing with sustainability, um, we'll be in a little bit better shape. One last point, and this um, has to do, I don't even know if there's a slide on this. Um, this has to do with um, sort of where this fits in this whole idea of um, environmental humanities. Um, and I'm, I'm, in a, I'm always in a weird position because I'm always sort of straddling the humanities and, um, uh, and the social sciences. Uh, I do political theory, but I also do environmental policy, and I do social movements, but I do the, the discourse of social movements. So um, it's, I'm always at that, um, that sort of intersection. But what this does for me, and one of the things that I'm continually trying to point out is the importance of practice, the importance of movements, the importance of public discourse within movements for the academy. So for me, one of the challenges of my career really has been to bring the discourse of movements to bear on academic notions like, like justice um, and you know, like political strategies. Uh, People in political science <laughs> don't want to hear that. Right? People in political science say, why are you elevating, why are you privileging the discourse of movements? Right? We political theorists have been dealing with justice fairly well on our own, very much, thank you. Right? Why are you bringing, and for me, the, the response to that is, because that's how the concepts that we talk about in the academy are used. Right? This is what it's about. This is the way that people are using this political concept that we're supposed to be about. Right? This is how it's being used in practice. And if we can't pay attention to that, if we can't use that to reevaluate the way that we think about things in the academy, um, then there's going to be this continued divide um, between academics uh, and what's actually happening out there on the ground. And you know, in an age of climate change, if, if academics are just going to um, be happy chatting with one another until they drown, um, so be it, but I'm not going to let that be. So I do assume that there's some value uh, in practice. I do assume that there's something uh, that academics can learn from the discourses, the understanding and the ideas, um, and the various ways that they're expressed uh, in movements. Um, so I stick to my belief in the importance of those uh, articulations. And that's one of these, that's where I'm interested in environmental humanities, I think, and that's where, you know, the theater stuff and the arts and all this, because that's a way, that affects public discourse. And if that public discourse affects the way that movements organize the discourse of movements, and that affects the way that we think about the very concepts that we're studying, then here's a crucial link um, between the environmental humanities and the environmental social sciences. 
So there's always been, for me and for a lot of folks out there, and I think that's demonstrated this, um, there's something salient, there's something engaging about the term environmental justice. It really fit the experiences uh, that people were having, that communities were subjected to, um, and it expanded the idea of social justice into a whole new realm uh, of inquiry uh, into environment and disadvantage. I think it reflects, environmental justice reflects the lived experience uh, of the reality of injustice uh, on the ground, uh, in the air, in one's food, uh, at the workplace or school, at the playground, down the street. Um, it's the salience of those experiences um, that have helped push the concept to be embraced globally uh, at a in a number of different places at a number uh, of different uh, levels. So in doing so, what I've been trying to argue is that environmental justice has moved from being simply this reflection uh, of another example of social inequity, right? Here's just another way that inequity is experienced um, to a statement really now about the crucial nature of the relationship um, between environment and nature on the one hand and the provision uh, of any kind of social justice on the other. Thanks. Thank you, David. That was, that was an excellent overview in sort of history and, and looking forward for environmental justice. So, question? I don't think I said that. I don't think the environmental justice movement is taking on everything. It is certainly taking on issues that will have an impact on everything. Climate change, for example. Energy transition, for example. But it, it, it's... Okay. Could you name a social issue that is not covered by your concept of environmental justice? Education? Schools are bad because there are pollutants in the air and everything. Well, they're bad that they're bad. No, but the schools are bad because there are pollutants uh, in the okay. air. Okay, so what's, uh, what's the point? What, what, you, are you, I'm worried that environmental justice... It's so big that it's meaningless? It's getting there. Yes, that's, yeah. Okay, that's, so... Yes. so yeah, we've yeah. Okay, so Frank, but I've got to give some background on Frank because Frank, Frank actually, um, you know, came up with one of the f the ideas, Lulu's locally unwanted land uses, that was one of the bases of the the, the early years of the environmental justice movement, and and it was appropriated probably uh, as a term um, by the environmental justice movement, and it was about specifically about land use uh, and problematic uh, land use and you know brownfields and. Uh, and, and all that. And yeah, Frank, it's really taken off from that. It's, it yeah. has been applied to more and more things. But I don't think that that means it doesn't mean anything. I, I mean, I, I, see the, the, I see the expansion of environmental justice as, a, as an important broadening. I mean, to go from just thinking about this is another symptom of injustice. The fact that I live next to this polluted factory or that this factory is dumping on my kids in their school, yeah. right? To, you know, look what we're doing in terms of climate change and how is that going to impact our ability to live as a community? I don't think that dilutes 
Right? And importantly, I'm not talking about a linear move from one to the other. Right? These movements about you know, how crappy the school is and the pollutants in the school, they're still there. Yeah. It's not that, oh, we're leaving this behind and now we're going to talk about these broad things. There are a lot of very specific environmental justice movements. But for me, the, one of the crucial things there is that they're linked. Right? There is, we were talking, weren't we talking about rhizomes? They're rhizomatic movements, right? I mean, they, they're linked. Uh, and there's something about having uh, a movement discourse that encompasses a number of different uh, issues that's empowering for people. It's not just about my battle against my school, or it's not just my battle about this. It is about this larger question that encompasses a lot of different questions and movements and practices that we need to change. And I don't see that as problematic. I see that as empowering. So you, this idea of um, sustainable materialism, I really like um, the, the environmental injustice, for example, say in Ghana, where most of our electronics waste is dumped, um, yet you have a society, maybe in America uh, predominantly, that is so driven by having the next greatest thing the new gadget, or the new phone, or the new computer. Um, and it's pushed upon us by corporations and Wall Street, having CEOs explicitly say that we need to shift uh, culture from a needs-based society to one of wants. Um, so what can be done to combat that kind of idea that's so predominant that you have to have the newest and greatest thing, and you have a new phone coming out every year that doesn't really change much from the year before. How do you combat these things to fight injustices in places like Ghana, where the waste of all those still viable technologies, but not the new cool thing, are dumb? So let me let me give two very different answers to that question. Um, I'm and one of them will get me into trouble because um, I'm not one of these folks who's anti-consumption. And I don't think, and I think this is really an important thing that comes out of the environmental justice community as well. Um, it's, not, um, it's not about giving up stuff. Uh, it's about, uh, it, like jobs. It's not about shutting down the factory. It's about making the factory work in a way that won't poison the community. Uh, and I feel the same way about products and, and consumption. And, and so the second part of that is one of the reasons why we know about this Right? Why, why electronic waste is this sort of known issue is because of the environmental justice movement. It started with a small group in the Silicon Valley, the Silicon Valley Toxics Coalition, um, that started, well, first working on worker health, but then electronic waste was major. And they've helped to change a number of different laws about, about what goes into products. They've been you know, part of the ranking system for a number of different computer companies. I mean, they've been really involved in that. And the very fact that this is part of the public discourse that you think about that when you buy stuff, right? That's due to the environmental justice movement. And that, to me, instead of looking, well, how can we change these practices, I look back and say, what has the movement done? And how has the movement changed discourse? And on that, the very fact that you're asking that question and feel that way um, is due to the movement. say that uh, the population explosion that we've been having in the last hundred years is a, a major cause of our environmental problems, if not the major cause. So how do you deal with that from an environmental justice perspective? Do you say we adopt a one child policy like in China or, or something else? It's, it's inevitable that you get the population question. So, <laughs> sorry, don't we? Um, you know, my answer to that is 100 people can fuck things up as good as 10 billion can. I don't, it's not the numbers. It's not the numbers. It's the practices. So um, changing the way that we grow food will have a huge impact on the number, uh, on the quality uh, of, uh, of processes on the planet. Right? It's not about the numbers. It's about the way that we do things. And I will stick with that until we all die out. I'm really struck by, um, and not because I thought you were just patting yourself on the back, 
but the moment where you're talking about the citations of your work uh, around the globe, and also your interchange with Frank about uh, the, the creation of terms that were important to activists. And I wondered if you could talk a little bit more about um, the role of the intellectual and the academic in this whole thing and how, I mean, because it seems very important, but not in a way uh, that people usually acknowledge. And it seems as though there's this activity of activists looking for yeah. this body of literature in a way that maybe we don't see so much and acknowledge enough. Yeah. Um, so to, yeah, to, a little background there. Um, I didn't. <laughs> so this piece comes out of um, uh, the the most recent issue of the journal Environmental Politics. It's the 21st anniversary issue of Environmental Politics. And what the editors did is they came to people who had published pieces in the last decade that were highly cited and said, "Can you reflect a bit uh, on the impact of your work or what's going on on this particular topic?" And that was the first time I went back and actually looked at who was using um, the, the work that I'd, I was just completely blown away. Um, so I didn't, yeah, I didn't set out to do that. I was asked to do that and was just, um, and that's just me. And I'm, you know, there's, I, I'm sure, you know, folks like Bullard and, and David Pello and, you know, there's just, there's going to be a lot more there. But um, I think, yeah, I mean, this is one of the reasons why I enjoy working on and with environmental justice. Uh, I think there is a, there's a relationship, sometimes respect, sometimes differences, but there's a relationship uh, between activism and the academy uh, on environmental justice. There are, there are leaders in the movement who uh, are in the academy, and there are leaders in the movement who, who teach, and there are movement or there are academics who are also in the movement and doing things uh, in their own community and you know being inspired by them so there's this uh, yeah uh, there's this appreciation uh, and this relationship but that's not unique i mean the environmental movement is uh, is the same and we've got folks here who've been involved in environmental policy um, you know from the, uh, you know back to the 70s so um, and there is that same sort of uh, relationship between th uh, 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 movement, inv the environmental movement, and uh, and scholars in the academy. But uh, yeah, so I, I I like. I mean, there are plenty of other things that you can look at where you wouldn't have that kind of relationship. But um, it is uh, there's just something. Um, I, I guess I wonder if I could think of a movement that didn't have that kind of relation. I guess for me, it's just I'm studying something that is active. It is in a community, and the and communities uh, have some sort of respect for that. So. Well, you have to remember, I spent 15 years in Arizona where the religious community would have absolutely nothing to do with this. Yeah. And yeah. in fact, it came out of UCC's first statement. Oh, yeah. No, oh, absolutely. The, the, yeah, the environmental justice movement, yeah, the United Church of Christ, was that was huge. And um, that sort of impetus and coming out of that relationship between civil rights and the churches uh, in the South, yeah, absolutely. So yeah, that that origin story, uh, yeah, um, that's just it was very odd to teach environmental justice in a place where there was not that connection Every between. Every Protestant and Catholic group in this country has an eco justice person working on these issues. It's very complex. Right, right, and Flagstaff is in Tucson, and Tucson is in Flagstaff. Or Phoenix, for that matter. There's a lot of stuff going on in Tucson um, that is linked to religious communities and, and has been for, for decades, and linked to religious communities, um, um, immigration, and environmental justice. Yeah. I just, yeah. So I, I think there's that, just where. I just want to say that there, there, are, there is stuff going on in Arizona. But yeah, but much less so than this origin story of environmental justice coming out of the UCC and the civil rights. Uh, and, I think, I mean, at least from my experience. And the other thing, I guess the other way of putting that, though, now that I think about it, um, is Native American environmental justice activism in Arizona. And that's where a lot of environmental justice activism is going. And that is driven by this sort of relationship between culture and place and. No mas muertes. No 
no more deaths. Sure. And and it's religious or you know uh, the, the 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 activism that came before that. Help me remember the name of, of the 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 um, reverend that went to prison. The seven people that went to prison because they were helping people get out of. Uh, no mass march has started as a it's a movement that puts well one of the things they do is is put water jugs out into the desert so that migrants won't yeah, won't die. So, yeah, there is, I didn't realize the one who was arrested for that, was, but people are being arrested just for, it's for littering or, for, you know, for right. putting water in the desert for, uh, and, and the religious community is very much, um, very much tied into that. Actually, uh, the, here's a segue, because um, one of the most interesting things, or one of the things that no, um, Nomas Muertes has done is just released a CD of music called Border Songs which is a great set, it's a, a you know, great set of songs about uh, uh, immigration um, that they're using as a fundraising um, uh, thing. So go online, look for Border Songs. It's a great fundraising tool for Nomas Muertes. Uh, David, we have a question up here. Um, one thing I was struck by is that you say that um, Americans are not recognized and therefore more easily victimized. Uh, I, I don't know if I quite got that right, but I was, I was thinking that you know, a couple of entities that are particularly um, not recognized are well, wildlife for one, one thing, but also um, the next generations, future generations, whether unborn or too young to vote, and all, all these entities are, um, cannot defend themselves. And uh, I, I'm just wondering, for instance, economics, uh, they, they don't recognize uh, ecosystem services as, as having any value, resources as having any value. Yeah. And, and of course, in legal, uh, I'm surprised there hasn't been any legal action events about climate change because they're screwing the future generations, but they have no, I guess, legal identity. So yeah, future generations don't have standing. Um, I'm wondering if, if any of this uh, environmental justice uh, can speak to any of these issues. Well, that's a packed question. So let me try and answer it with one example getting to the very beginning um, uh, about Native Americans and recognition. So this, I'll bring Arizona back into it again. Uh, one of the biggest environmental justice battles in Arizona recently has been over um, the Snow Bowl, which is a ski uh, resort outside of Flagstaff, uh, making snow with reclaimed sewage water. Uh, and the snow area is on a sacred peak, or a peak that's sacred to at least 14 tribes in Arizona, uh, including both Navajo and Hopi. And so the tribe sued, right? This was a violation of, and for each tribe, there's a different reason um, for each tribe. But I will never forget, um, so this was proposed, years ago it was proposed, uh, and the Native American communities erupted uh, in anger, and the front page of the Flagstaff paper had an editorial that basically made fun of and lambasted any kind of land-based religion. Right? How can this place be holy? What a ridiculous idea. You know, not like something in the sky is, you know, any, I mean, it's just, it was this insulting stereotyping and dismissal, this non-recognition of the validity and the viability of native religions. Now, one of the things that could not be heard, right, that could not be brought into this whole legal debate um, was about future generations. Right? So one of the arguments, for example, of Navajo was that they could no longer collect medicinal plants on the mountain because the water was touched by death. If the water flows through hospitals and it flows through funeral parlors, and then it get so they didn't care about the crap, um, but it was about the bodies. Uh, and if the plants are touched by that water, the plants are no longer medicinal. They can't be harvested, which means that they can't bring the plants from the holy site to their houses and make medicine bundles, which means that they can't pass on their tradition to the next generation. They can't reproduce this crucial part of their culture and their interaction with the natural world for the next generation. And that fear of that disconnect, that it's not just that you're pissing on a mountain, it's that you are going to stop our culture 
It's cultural genocide. That's a huge term to use, but that's what the president of Navajo called it. It's cultural genocide. Um, and that was it. It's the next generation that's going to be impacted. Um, and that didn't sail in the courts. The court's response was um, that's uh, Indians, not even talking about the different tribes, uh, individual subjective uh, understanding of the issue. Right? And so there's, you can go ski on shit in Flagstaff now. Uh, it's there. <laughs> on that note, yeah. <laughs> 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 <laughs>